we are Freddy Kruyer we recorded. Just coming up, mate. I think we've we've drunkenly spoken about this at least two times, at least twice about sorting it out over the last two years, maybe. Mm, I think the first time you asked me was my fiftieth birthday. When was that? Uh, four Twenty years, years ago. Four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> was it four years ago? Can't yeah, have been four years ago. It was. 50, when did I start this? Fifty-four. Oh, four years ago. Yeah. Fifty-four this year. Oh, that was at the pub in Collie. Yeah. That was and it. Bruce was there, wasn't he? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yes. Anyway. Time flies, mate. Anyway. I'm sure we'll come on to that. <laughs> or elements around that. Uh, Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak? Well, originally, <laughs> I would have... I personally thought Ben Wallace was perfectly suited to it. But he didn't want to go for it. Um, I would... <clears throat> Me personally, I think I'm leaning towards this trust, but at the end of the day, that's just the figurehead of the boat. You know, the currents are going to take the boat where it's going to go, or well, they're the captain of the boat. So either of them, they can become prime minister based on what they say, but tomorrow something else happens and they have to completely change direction anyway. So they're all the same, essentially. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think personal values play a lot more. I think I, th- I do think that British PMs have more power than what we think, maybe. And so personal values are really key to it. Yes. As opposed to someone like the President of the United but, States, for example. Well, I was literally going to say, I think a big reason people didn't like Trump is because he funded himself into power. All right? So he wasn't beholden to anyone. So the NRA in America is has got massive sway over the government in certain ways and shapes and forms. But he didn't know anyone. And in politics, you only get where you are by doing deals here, there, left, right and centre. And For example, they have all the selection phase through the, the first to the final two candidates. All goes through Parliament. So the MPs get to decide who the two candidates are going to be. Like I said, Ben Wallace would probably have been the great one because he was Scottish. or he, Yeah, he's Scottish. Why is that a plus? Because we've got all this stuff going on with the Scottish independence. Yeah. So Scotland looks to Britain and says, yeah, well, it's all you English people, blah, blah, blah. But if you had a Scotchman as a prime minister, people might in Scotland might be more inclined to <coughs> listen to a bit of what he's saying. He'd been in the armed forces, which didn't necessarily make him a hero, but Anyone who's been in the armed forces has a certain moral code to some extent, right? You still get people who take the mick out of everything, take the piss and all the rest of it. But you do tend to, you know, you tend to try and be as fair as you can. You might be quite robust, but you're still quite fair in your, in your, in your judgments and decisions. And um, there's some other things about him that, that would have just fitted everything perfectly well that that was part of it he hadn't ever been part of the government i think that's partly why he didn't want to do it um and he wasn't soiled by all them scandals and all the rest of it but i i would say tr- liz truss but actually whoever you get where well, even if there was a snap election and labor got in the country's going to go the way the country's going to go hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting point about the the way they were selected. <clears throat> I was talking to someone last week or the week before who's got I don't I don't pretend to have a good handle on all the inner workings and what people are doing and what they think and or I even really understand politics to any level of depth any more than anyone else. But this guy does. And he's also got some indirect connections to people close to the Johnsons and other people in parliament. Uh, uh, in government uh, or in politics and uh, he was he mentioned about that about the way the two leaders or the way that that that, that, uh, what's it, that shortlist was process, selected yeah, yeah. And, and apparently a lot of the conservative members are pretty pissed off yeah. and one reason is because they didn't really want Johnson to go uh, for whatever reason maybe because they didn't feel that there was anyone else could would be in a good position to step in to be to put them on the best foot for the, the general election 
Uh, but also because they had no say in who got shortlisted, were. and they, these you know, members they pay to be a part of the membership, and they didn't have any any say in yeah. who was being shortlisted. So they're pretty fucked off. Um, yeah, but then you got to look at what happened to the Labour Party previously, where the members had the choice, and they made that choice, but it didn't go well for the Labour Party. Remind me, which one was this? Go With on. Jeremy Corbyn. What to select Jeremy Corbyn? Yeah, that mm. was down to the members' ballots and all the rest of it. They didn't have the same process the Conservatives have. So you can understand, but they're wanting to protect their <coughs> interests, aren't they? They're like, well, if we pick the wrong person, I could be out of a job next week. Or if they pick that person, I could be out of a job because I'm always head-to-head with him over this, that or the other. So there's a lot. It's all that old boys' network, so to speak, in deciding who they get. So the final two candidates, basically, the, the actual party... <laughs> Party, uh, the MPs are happy with whichever one they get. They don't. They're not too fussed at the end of the day. But the, I'm not in it. It's just me as a layman talking to you about what little I know about politics. But I think we do need to go back to the days. For example, I think post World War Two, something like forty percent of the members of Parliament were just working people. You know, and, and, but that figures down to something ridiculous, like ten five percent now. What about what do you mean by working people? Well, people who hadn't gone to uh, Oxford and um, blimey, what's everyone called? They were working class. <laughs> yeah, they they weren't like they didn't come <coughs> from affluent backgrounds. I mean, I I was always going back to a question you asked me before we started this. Uh, Churchill, you know, there, there's a something to look up to and aspire to and all the rest of it. Do you know, he, he wrote three memoirs, I think it was, of his entire life. And it, you go back to when he started out as a reporter, it's incredible what he did. And then you get some footballer who's written ten, ten memoirs, ten autobiographies. Um, but the point is, I used to think he was amazing. And then I went to, we did some work at uh, his home. It's like a massive palace. Can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. And I'm thinking, this is where he grew up. You know, he it kind of lowered him in in my cell, in my esteem. He went down a bit because of where he come from. You know, if you, you don't you don't get someone who reaches the top of politics who grew up on a council estate. That's never ever gonna happen. But actually, that person growing up in a council estate will have better life experiences to share within Parliament. Yeah, I understand. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, the problem with it is, though, is... But you do need educated people to to make these big decisions. This is the thing. Yeah, I think it's... uh, I mean, yeah, the dirty... The dirty... The dirty little thing. Essentially, somebody from a very wealthy background could potentially buy their way into politics buy friends, this, that and the other, and, and work their way up the chain. Which isn't which happens. options that aren't particularly open to likes of here and you, for example. Mm. Yeah, it's not a drama if you can hold them accountable when they don't do what you what the electorate yeah, want yeah. to do. I mean, again, we, going, going back to Boris, again, my uh, unqualified opinion, I think a big part of his downfall was down to his missus. <coughs> Why do you think that? Well, she's kind of pulling the strings in the background, not on the political front, but on his social life. And then he's trying to cover all that up. And uh, basically lying about all that stuff is what what brought him down in the end. But the parties were organised by her. Um, He should have just said, yeah, I was wrong, shouldn't have done it. And that would have been it all done and dusted and over with. Because he dragged it out for so long and he started digging deeper and deeper holes, he just couldn't come back for it. I, I mean, people are throwing stuff at me in the street, probably, but I quite like Boris Johnson, you know, and I had hoped he could stay, but after all them lies and that, even I was like, you, you can't, that's not the way to behave if you want to be the leader of one of the most powerful countries in the world. You can't do that. Yeah, <coughs> I, I admit I, I liked him. <coughs> that's not that's not me saying, oh, I liked everything about his politics. Like, 
and uh, you know and decisions he made in terms of you know political decisions and all that. But I liked him, and the and the and in the same way I no let me rephrase that I preferred him to the alternatives, mm. and in the same way I preferred Trump to the alternatives. And the, the sole reason being is I saw them as more authentic people. Now, when I say authentic, I don't mean like truth telling. Like you just give examples yeah. of bullshitting. But authentic in that, I just felt like they were they, they were more trustworthy. That's not to say they were completely trustworthy. Yeah. But they were less, they, it was easier to tell if they were being genuine in what they were doing or saying than others were. And, I, and, and that is with the caveat that. 99.9% of what these people say is bullshit. Yeah, so you can't trust any all politicians. Yeah, no, it's part of the job. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. think what you're saying there is <clears throat> they would get asked the question and they would answer it. They wouldn't go every which way round the houses to avoid <clears throat> actually answering the question because they don't want to commit one way or the other. You would ask them a question and they would give you an answer and that that's what I liked about it. Whether they were lying or not is a different matter. Yeah. But normally, like I was listening to a thing on the radio on the way in, they're quizzing this MP. So tell me, it, it's quite clear and obvious. What is the answer? Oh well, what you've got to think is we can't do this, and we've got to. And he's going, you just answer the question, and they do everything they can not to answer it. But when you get an MP or politician or whatever, someone in a position of authority who just answers the question, at least you've got an answer. That's one of the interesting things that's happened over the last couple of years, I think, with, with the media, is they are becoming less tolerant of that, of people that answer the question. Whereas five, ten years ago, maybe even three, four years ago, if a if a if a an a presenter or an interviewer asked a politician a question, they would just let them dance around it and answer and give the politician's answer. But like you're saying, they they tend to be calling it out more now. And well, I think it's because I think the only reason is because they can give give it the the headline such and such refuses to answer that, but it's a good thing to be holding to. The other thing with Boris and and uh, Trump, the other thing was there was elements of they were just morons in certain ways. Do, do you know they what I mean? were a bit more like the common it, person. It, exactly my point. Like were, the exactly common person the gets up, goes to work, tries to do the best job he can, but you know you might be driving a forklift with a pallet of beer on it and it falls off and smashes. You're like, uh, what happened there? You were going too fast. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. Yeah. Well, you look at all. But how it many... turns out you were going too fast, you know, and and that that's why people relate well to them because they're like, you you're doing a much harder job than me driving that forklift, and I fuck up. <clears throat> so if you fuck up, it's it's got to be expected. You're not you're not a superhuman or a god. You're just a normal person, and actually, you're only making the decisions as people below you are actually operating the system. And when they fuck up, you've got to take responsibility for it because you're the figurehead. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, I have heard in the past that um, a lot of Boris Johnson's, uh, uh, the way he, he would uh, present himself as that sort of bit of a bit of a moron. You know, dishevelled hair, his tie would be squiff. I have heard in the past that most of the time it's calculated. So he would he would be yeah. deliberately presenting himself in a really poor way because again back to your point these people well, so looks these like people have grown up. up these people have grown up in in you know in that uh middle or upper class very privileged um upbringing i'm not saying mm. that having a privileged yeah. upbringing is a wrong thing they have where you're taught the importance of smartness the way to do a wins or not you know the importance of making yourself etiquette. look presentable and etiquette and how to do well in business and yet in boris johnson's case for example just not he's just all over the shop i yeah. mean i he, he, when he, when he was close to getting binned off and then and then did get binned off, all those you know, all your clips of him from different things when he was London mayor, like hanging off that zip, hanging line. off the zip line. Have you ever seen the one where he? This is one of my favourite ones, right? He he's on the site, the Bank of the Thames, and it, he's London mayor. And they present they're promoting something or something like that. It's got to do with basketball, and he's got a basketball, and there's a basketball hoop there, and he shoots the basketball. And it, he fucking scores, right? And it goes in. <laughs> and he he goes crazy. He gets so excited. He's like, he's super happy. He's like, yes, yes. But 
you are looking at an upper class guy, you know, like he's the very the only hoop he's ever scored. Yeah. Oh my god, he's so happy. <laughs> but again, back to that authenticity. Yeah. Not saying he was the greatest prime minister in the world, but if it was a the choice between him and people who pretend there's something and they're not, pretend that they're really close to, and it's obvious they're pretending that they're really close to the normal people. I mean, Rishi Sunak. Did well, you see his video? again, partly while oh leaning towards Liz Truss, because Rishi Sunak, yeah, I mean, he had that thing where he was filling the car up with petrol, the little Kia car or something. It weren't his, he just borrowed it off someone in the supermarket for a press <laughs> photo. Because he, he drives around in a, I don't know what. But the the thing, the other thing for those people who are, are lucky enough to benefit from those kind of upbringings is when something goes wrong, they can generally fix it with money or they know someone who can fix it and it ain't going to cost them anything. For likes of us, when something, like your car breaks down, right? my wife's car might end up costing 800 quid to get fixed, right? That's a big chunk of my money for the month. Well, a couple of months to pay to sort it all out. Whereas for them, it's like, oh, yeah, just send it down the garage and they'll take it to the main dealer garage where it costs a fortune to get paid. But it don't bother them. And that's where they lose that um, connection with, with the majority of the population of the country who... Like at this present time, are struggling with a gas, electric, all that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, British politics is in a bad place, isn't it? Bad place. It is, but someone, I can't remember, it might have been my dad, said something about um, as bad as our politics is, it's still one of the fairest, best systems in the world. Yeah. As bad as it is, because. More people benefit from our system in a lot of other countries. You know, people, third world countries, people are in power for decades and they rake in millions, if not billions of pounds mm. and the population get no benefit. A, a prime example, I wasn't there, but one of our patrols in Afghan, when we first got there, went in the village, hello, we're the British Army, President Karzai is invited us here to give you peace and security and rebuild and da 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 da. And the village elder kind of said, well, what happened to the Russians? Because it doesn't matter who's running the country. They see no benefit in any way, shape or form. It's like, yeah, great, whatever. Yeah. But at least, at least in the UK, yeah, it's not a perfect system. But there are far worse ones out there in the world. So we, we don't do too bad on the Yeah, whole. it is relative. But I, I think we... we... I, I think it's sliding further. further I think it's just, it's getting worse. I think it's getting worse to, and, uh, 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 for two reasons. I mean, one, the situation at the minute, at the minute, like if we had a, if Labour had a stronger leader, then... You've got to have a yeah, strong opposition. This is the problem because they've had, they've been so fucking weak over the last however many, however many years that it means that the Conservatives, they can get away with more. They can make, especially with the they majority, can, as in they can make mess ups and be less concerned about losing an S general election or having four votes no confidence for, or having a prime minister have to step down early, because they because the opposition leader is so so weak, and because they've got so little chance of losing an next general election, which means they can get away with more bullshit. And the other, <clears throat> and the other reason I think is because I really strongly feel this po politics over the last. Ten years at least. The way the politi the way politicians, and I'm generalising, right? Because there are good, there are good politicians out there who are well-meaning and, and they're, they're doing it for the right reasons, right? But the way that most of them operate, especially the upper echelons, closer to the you know, closer to the, to the tip of the whatever part they are, they're not they're not operating. So I look at the opposition, like Labour aren't operating to keep the conservative conservatives in check and running the country they should. Labour are oper operating to do anything they can to get into power. And and conservatives conversely. Conservatives are operating to yeah. making decisions to do everything they can to make it the be the best place to live for British people. They're doing it to do everything to not lose power. It's the wrong it's like the politics is serving politics. It's not doing anything I really believe it. It's not doing anything else. Like the values 
that they say are the values of, of government are not the value. That's not how they're operating by. It's a fucking terrible way to be. Terrible way to be. It's just, just slides down the scale. To your point, Labour need to get a grip of themselves. Yeah. Keir Starmer ain't the man. Jeremy Corbyn wasn't the man. <coughs> or AA and other. Because um, so, I've never voted for Labour. But... <laughs> You right wing fascist. Well, no, this, is a, this is another thing we'll discuss <laughs> shortly. But uh, and I, I can't remember his surname now. Who was who was before Corbyn? The the two brothers. Uh, oh. He had a bit of a lisp. His oh. brother David Miliband. David Miliband. If he, I would have voted for Labour if he had become leader of the Labour Party <clears> because <throat> at the, certainly at the time he seemed quite well adjusted, you know, he, he didn't seem like he was in it, like you were just saying, just, we got to get into power and all that, he had, seemed to have some really good ideas, and at the last minute, his, his brother stabbed him in the back, didn't he, yeah, and, and yeah. took over, and he now, he, David now runs a, a charity organisation of some description, but I seriously, I, I, I would have voted for him, and it, and it, it shouldn't just be based on the individual, you know, but subsequently, you know, whatever your political views, you've got to look at the options that were on the table when, when Jeremy Corbyn was up for election. The, the, it was just insane, some of the things they were promising, you know. You can't just say, look, here's everything, because people will say, well, how are you going to pay for that, <laughs> you know? Mm. Do you think the government handled handled the uh, Afghan evacuation or or, or like that, uh, the evacuation of labour or withdrawal correctly? Um, can we just come back to that? I just want to finish off something we were saying before. Uh, the other thing in politics now, if if you are conservative, if you're nothing but a right wing extremist, and if you're a Labour voter, you're nothing but a left wing communist. Maoist, you know, there's there's no middle ground anymore. Yeah, and I the think people that try to fill the middle ground uh, are, are blurring the lines too much that they still end up on one side of the fence or the other. Yeah, I think that's predominantly only an uh, uh, existing on social media, though. I think that is. Yeah, which is like in the real world, like you just said. Oh yeah, yeah. You would have voted for Labour. Parliament. Now, if we were two different yeah. people, and you when we were sat here, no, and you said I would have voted for Labour. Like, people, hell, people are because of social media. People are inclined. If you ask them who you're voting for, people are inclined to say, "Well, that's my business," or try and guess who you're voting for and tell you that. So when they do all these polls, for example, they're never accurate anymore. Because people don't want to go, yeah, I'm going to vote Conservative. Because some of them might go, oh, you're a right-wing extremist. Well, well it used to be. You'd ne- you, it would be something you wouldn't ask. It was a very personal question. Yeah, yeah. I, especially when I, I remember when I was growing up, so I was taught. My old man, my old man taught me was, you know, you, do, you, don't, you shouldn't really ask people's political leanings yeah. because it's a personal thing. And yet now... I think I don't think it is the case now. I think is if you're asked, you feel people people feel obliged to say it because they want to sh- they on this side or yeah, that side. But I know what you're saying, but my point about you being classed something or other because of your political views, uh, all the actors and people in Hollywood and all that getting involved in political issues, some of them have been like cancelled outright because they came out on the wrong side of the public or the social media perception and that and I think things like um, sports people actors anyone in a influential position that is not actually in politics <coughs> should completely stay out of it and be completely neutral because you, you can destroy the whole like with the um, with the World Cup with the, with the England team and that you know I don't think there's anyone well there obviously are people out there but the majority of people would agree with the um, supporting things against racism and all that. But a lot of people didn't agree with them taking the knee and all the rest of it. And you shouldn't bring all that politics into sport. It should just be sport. For but the argument is, but the argument is made against that is well, it's not po- it's not politics. It's about uh, racial equality. But 
But yeah, I've just found out that most people will support. It's being politicised. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the drama. Yeah. That's, well, uh, weaponised by Labour. Yeah. It goes back to that, that polarisation um, we were just talking about. It's a flipping nightmare. I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing to do. And it's the same, same, you know, same in America and uh, Canada. Hideous, hideous. Uh, back to Afghan. Yeah, so that's actually a year this month, isn't it? Was it? When we pulled out of there, yeah. Hot pitting. And to answer your question... Uh, Holy shit, it is, yeah. Oh, my God, where's the year <laughs> gone? I, I mean, it literally happened overnight. I remember uh, reading something about uh, Bagram Airfield. The Americans are like, yeah, right. spoken to the Afghans, yeah, tea in the morning. <laughs> and then, like, two o'clock in the morning, they all just got on a plane and left, just abandoned it. You know, and I, I think the government's reaction to it, because they weren't particularly, as far as anyone knows, the government weren't aware of what was coming. I think we reacted to it brilliantly. I mean, I, I wasn't in at the time, but throughout my career and the history of the regiment, that's one of the things I'm really proud of the regiment for, the way they dealt with that. And you, speaking to some of the people that were there and listening to some of the stories that didn't get in the news and that, for example, there's one lad who, who could speak um, Afghan, for want of a better description, he was up on top of shipping containers for like 18, 20 hours a day, basically liaising between our blokes and the Taliban for getting people into the airport. 18, 20 hours a day, he's just a young lad, 20 years old, you know, but it was so crucial to that whole role. And, and both sides could kind of trust him because he's native, he could speak the language properly. <coughs> And obviously he's working for the British forces. That's just one tiny example of that. Um, but yeah, what they did there was just absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, it's what it's a it's an op that super super proud of. I went down like and I mean, like to your point, but oh, that lad eighteen twenty hours on the container. The stuff those guys had to do there. I mean, you you know you and I serve in multiple places. We yeah you know, we did Afghan in a completely different role, right? And I think. I think every that, tour was different. Yeah, yeah, and I think that pit in is hands down harder than anything I did. Like, I, I can't see how it's not. It's so different. It's unusual. Very difficult to train for. Well, it, it wasn't, was it? It was literally, as far as I'm aware, the, most of the regiment was on leave, and they went, we need you out there, and they had they had something like 70, 80% of the blokes back from leave within 18 hours, and they deployed, like, three days later. So there was no training. There wasn't any real preparation. It was literally making it up on the ground as it went along. Yeah. Yeah. It was fucking crazy. Um, what point was I making there? Oh, God. It threw me <laughs> off, Freddie. You're saying about a young lad up on the container and the lack of... Well, they normally do that training. Oh, how difficult it was. Yeah, yeah. how yeah, difficult yeah. it was. Um, yeah, I was talking to a medic who who was there when, well, he was out there, and he was talking about when that, when the suicide bomb went off. Mm. And the British guys, the three power had just handed over that position to the Americans, and then the Americans got blown up. And he was saying that when the when the bodies were coming in, so he was, at, he was with the med reg, and uh, they are having to get all the medics in from the from three power, all the young the young medics in to assist with it. And he, he was just said it was just hundreds, just bodies laid. They were just literally on the back of the truck and then just getting chucked off the truck. I mean, not chucked, yeah, yeah, take yeah. off the truck from the back, just trying to triage hundreds of these, you know, women, well, people, kids. Mm. You know, it's fucking horrendous, just horrendous, horrendous situation. And then um, I wonder what well, I. Well, that, that certainly wasn't. In the plan originally, was it? No, but I wonder what I wonder how the guys who like you and I, who did tours of Afghan beforehand in on Herrick and then went out and then did that. I wonder how, wonder what they think about it. You know, I mean the RSM, of, the RSM of three power, he was out on the yeah, Herrick yeah. tours. Yeah. You know, he's he's our era or my era, and uh, I'm, obviously I'm younger than you, so we're. <laughs> Um, I think everybody's. I wonder what he, you know, I wonder what he thinks of it. 
difficult. It's difficult to reconcile wh- where it is now because it's, it's in a worse position than when we went in. Well, uh, I would have... So, the way the... Well, the way the army reacted to the situation was, was amazing. The government side of it, they, they got involved in it instantly. You know, they wasn't dragging their heels over it and all that. But it is absolutely shocking how quickly the... On the one hand, it's absolutely shocking how quickly the Afghan army folded. On the other hand, you've got to look at why that occurred. And it, it you got guys, I don't know, a couple hundred blokes in an outpost. They haven't been paid for months. They, they, they've got, they haven't been paid, and they've got to go and get their own food locally and all the rest of it. And then the Taliban come along, getting however much they get, but they're getting paid, they're getting fed. And they're like, look, you can either surrender or we're going to kill you. And they're like, oh, well, I'll give up, man. Because this lot aren't supporting me. I haven't been paid for months. Why should I sit here and fight and die? What's, what's the reason for that? So there is a lot of reasons why the Afghan army folded so quick. I think if they'd have been supported by their government much better, it would have been a different story. Yeah. All, all they want to do is exist, right? Yeah. You know, if we think back to when we've been insurers and stuff, Keely do engagements when we were out there on the Herrex. And you, they just tell you what you want to hear. Because in reality, they're either being governed by us, which they were in a way, we were the controlling Im- influence yeah. when we were in those areas, especially in the, the remote parts of uh, Afghan, like Helmand and you, know, you mentioned um, uh, on the other, the other, you know, the, the other provinces. Um, they just do what they do to get by, they can keep generating money from wherever the business is, farming, selling, flipping water, selling ice, yeah. you know, selling the crops, <coughs> whatever. And then it's just a, just a, a, all lazy, just another regime change. Yeah, and now I'm going instead of instead of having to abide by your laws, I'm going to have to abide by these laws. And, yeah, they, and, exactly. but, and in a strange way, they almost they they probably they probably understand better where they're at and what expected them expected them and what's not allowed. With Taliban rule, yeah. as opposed to our rule, same culture. It's, they've been under that rule for God knows how long. I'm not saying it's the right, I'm not saying the correct thing. Yeah, but yeah, from a, you know, from the Joe Bloggs Civ Pop perspective in Afghan, they just do what they need to survive because because politics and government and all that doesn't really influence them in the remotest part. It just doesn't influence well, it, them. Well, the, the influence is really just cabal. Whoever's in charge, well, the Taliban are an exception to that because of the way they operate. But generally. Whoever's in charge is only in charge in Kabul. Because outside of that, it's all the different warlords and all the rest of it. But now the Taliban are in, in charge. They're kind of... You can carry on and do what you want to do, but you answer to us. And and they've got all the warlords on their side. I think there was one holding out in Panjshir Valley or something like that, wasn't there? Yeah. What's... Uh, so... Nothing's been done at the moment. In terms of how backwards it's gone, uh, you know, female oppression and yeah, yeah. all the rest of it. What should we, could we do? Oof. There is actually a, a bloke who's in our regiment who's working out there with a charity. Um, and it surprises me how many people are working out there. Um with the Taliban's permission. So the Taliban do want to do the right thing to an extent, but again, like we were saying about politics earlier on, corruption is just the way of the world out there. It's how everything works. Um, I don't, I, and a lot of people forget as well, before, round about the time the Russians were out there, like in the 60s and 70s, it, it was quite cosmopolitan. You know, people, women went to university, they wore normal sort of Western clothes, um, and life was quite good. But then the religious influences take over, and I'm not, I'm not a particularly religious person. I'm not not religious, um, and I'm quite accepting and understanding of other people's religions. But <clears throat> it's just a the extreme versions of any religion are very difficult to deal with. 
I don't, no, no, not, not, not right, I don't think, personally. Hmm. Yeah. The, so, you, the other thing is, as far, I might get this completely wrong, but there's a, uh, a version of Islam called Wahhabi Islam, which is generally where all these extreme versions of it come from but that was actually designed by the British to control the Arabs in Saudi Arabia and that sort of thing around World War Two post World War Two because it was a, a strong version of the religion people would have to stick to it <coughs> and at the time the people practice or delivering that version were kind of under British influence however that morphed into essentially ISIS and, and all that kind of stuff. And don't quote me on that because I'm not a historian <laughs> or a religious well, theologist, but uh, that's kind of how I understand it. Yeah, I mean, that, the question gets raised, isn't it? What, um, what was the point of being there? Is one, that's the common one. What was the point of being there? Was it all for nothing? Blah, 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 blah. So you try and look at has there been any benefit whatsoever? Right? The only one I can see, as in long term benefit, which, which is what's different now to what's than it was pre 2001, right? Is that you, you wouldn't have had, so you could, we wouldn't be being able to engage on a political level with the Taliban now, uh, then, like we do now. So, that 20 years of, however, yeah, 20 years of fucking Western influence, military influence in Afghan, I think that is one thing that's produced. I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this validates the whole, all of the operations and all the lives lost and all the lives impacted and all that. But one of the, the, the positives out there is that we do, uh, we do have the ability to engage with on a, on a, on a, on this political level and they seem to be, they seem to be less yeah uh, they're not chopping people's heads off in the sports grounds and all that sort of it, they might be but they're not filming it now <laughs> <laughs> well no my point is, what i'm getting at is um we look back to northern ireland right many many years ago it it was about the irish republican army and and in our view terrorism etc etc but then they came to realise that actually the best way to beat us was at the ballot box. And now they have actually got the majority instalment, although the um, unionists are refusing to form a government. And maybe the Taliban have not necessarily seen something in that, but come to realise that actually if we want to prosper, we do need to kind of abide by this world idea of... of diplomacy and, and that sort of thing yeah. maybe that's what they've learned over the last Pro 20 years yeah and probably the, mainly probably mainly due to the economic impact i mean the yeah. <laughs> afghan is much more well, i don't think they could have suffered any more than they already than than they already are you know it's uh yeah they've had it for best part of 50 years i guess different nations fighting over it and to get back to your point about what was what was the point of it um essentially Afghanistan is a massive strategic piece of real estate and whoever controls Afghanistan controls all these other <laughs> avenues here, there and everywhere and that's partly what that all boils down to um, I was going to say something else well that's why Russia went in the first place partly wasn't it, was it was strategic, yeah. strategic, and, and you think strategic we, we, were, we were training the Mujahideen at the time to fight the Russians and I'd Without doubt, they were helping the insurgency against the the Allies, Americans, the British, etc., that were out there. Without a doubt, even if that was just purely out of spite, but um, at least we got out of there in a in a better position than the Russians did. I mean, they left so many people behind there; it's un unreal. Um, and then you look <coughs> at what what they're doing in in uh, Ukraine, supposedly they've lost in the region of 15,000 troops in four or five months, which is more than all 
all the Allied troops that were lost in 20 years in Afghanistan. So the current attrition rate is unsustainable for them in, in Ukraine. But we are talking about Afghan at the moment. So. What, uh, what part of your time in Afghan sticks in your mind as the most impactful on you? Oh, um, get deep. <laughs> the, I can still remember when we first, well, let's just roughly go for it. When we first got there, Bastion was... 2006. Yeah, Bastion was just sand. We had a 12 by 12 tent, <coughs> no air conditioning, no electricity, nothing. You just in this tent, was just full of dust and sand and all the rest of it. Um, and then we went up to Goresh, and then you had them, although it's always misquoted, you had the Defence Secretary saying something along the lines of, we're not going to fire around in anger. And we were patrolling out of Goresh, and, that, and uh, it was a bit like, a, <laughs> as bad as Northern Ireland could have been at times, it was a bit like a really crap tour of Northern Ireland. And then there was a... It wasn't a contact, but there was some there was some ammunition had been fired somewhere, heard these rounds going off and it was all like, oh a bit bit of a panic and all that and we'd come back doing all the reports and all the rest of it. And that was it. We all, all went quiet again. And then I think was it A company did an op and there was a con a genuine contact involved in that. that, was that. And then uh to put it in a bit of context a good friend of mine was killed in Iraq um, by an IED. And it was like tragic news, you know. It was like, oh, dude, because everyone kind of knew him. Okay. And um, I changed my R&R so I could go back through his funeral. But when I went back, the company I was with at the time went out to do a Shura, and it, it, it essentially it was an ambush. And it was a massive firefight there. It was in the papers and all the rest of it because it was... Like a massive event till three or four months later it was just like something that was happening every day ten times the scale and all the rest of it but to answer your question um, I still remember sitting on the back of the Chinook when we flew out to Masakala we sat on, sat, sat to Masakala or from two <laughs> sat on that Bergen because now we're in the point where we know the situation and we know what's going on there we've been briefed and all the rest of it um, and I remember sitting on my Bergen in the middle of the Chinook looking out and just watching those lights disappear from Bastion and just thinking <laughs> well, I might sound a bit pikey but I wonder if I'm ever going to see them again uh, and then you're just flying around in the dark and whatever and the next thing I remember is that bloke chucking that Chinook around and all I can see out the windows is the roofs of the houses I'm thinking he's Rotors are going to hit them in a second, and then you smack down on the floor. Everyone's off it, and it's gone. And it's just that complete silence and the dust settling. And you know, While you're waiting to be engaged, it, it's quite nice here <laughs> for that brief moment. <laughs> and then, uh, obviously, we had those few days. It was first two or three days. It was quite quiet, wasn't it? And, and then it all went crazy. But you, your question was oh, just remind me of it. What was the most impactful in, yeah, yeah. in your mind in, in Afghan? So that was that. And actually, that day we walked into the cookhouse in Suta, Camp Suta. We, in Kabul? Yeah. And we it was like one of them westerns that everyone just went quiet. And we were coming with our beards and slightly dirty clothes. And they all knew where we'd come back from. And we walked in there after living on a packet of beans a day or whatever and the first thing in the in that at the hot plate was a fridge freezer full of Harkin Dars ice cream <laughs> and I think everyone in that queue was just looking at that as if it was the reason it was impactful is because what we would been doing was normal and then when we've gone into that cookhouse it was that realization that actually what we've been doing isn't normal this is the normal, and it is that, yeah, that like realization that actually I've been living in a completely different world. <laughs> the past, we went back to first. Yeah, yeah, but we, uh, 
uh, for some reason that, that suitor. sticks in I remember mind. suitor because, well, <clears throat> I remember Bastion because when we cut off, we got told. Remember this? We got told um, that extraction didn't happen and uh, you won't mention it. Remember that? I don't mention it. Yeah. <laughs> we, all, we all got pulled together and we didn't want the pods. Um, called, yeah, that, that, like, that, that so didn't everyone. happen. And then we walked into uh, yeah, um, yeah, a similar thing, walking into the Bastion cookhouse. But I went in with Jared. I can't remember why me and him went, were separate where everyone else was. Probably off the wrong pods. We went in there and yeah, the boot necks were in there. Fresh as a daisy, they hadn't been in, in long, I and mean, yeah, we were just yeah. fucking ragged. And well, you just see, like, it's not long time, <laughs> time right? Yeah, though. and you weren't allowed in it. You're supposed to be clean shaven. You go in, you weren't allowed in with your weapons, and we were like, fuck this, going to get going, going to get scoffed. Fuck yeah. everyone, no one said anything. When the cookouts got our food, sat down, mm-hmm. and it was just like, no one to say a word. And then when we got to suit her on the way out, in Kabul, I remember that, yeah, I remember we got the cookouts, but I <laughs> reason I remember it is going through the hot plate, I'd had a dessert, yeah, like. And and when I when we left for Musakala, let me think about this. Yeah, I went from Mus- I went to Musakala from I think I went direct from. Mm, no, it wasn't that no, was had. No, when we went to Musakala, I got bumped. I was in the scoff house in Bastion having food. I just coming off the ground. My dessert was in front of me, and I got called up the the jock to go and get orders for, or a brief or whatever. And I looked at my dessert and thought, oh, I'll leave it there. I'll come back. I'll come back and finish it. And I left, and then that was it. Straight on the chopper, we were going to Musakala. <laughs> Fuck, left my dessert. <laughs> and then we were Musakala for all that time. And so then when we came back, got the suitor, dessert at the end of the dessert at the end of the hot plate, and it was um, sponge of some sort with chocolate custard. And I love chocolate custard. I love <laughs> chocolate custard. It was right at the end that they were just about to shut the kitchen yeah. down. Right at the end, sponge on the plate. You know, I had my other food. Sponge on the plate. Put the chocolate custard over it. Sat down. I had my meal. By this time, the kitchen shut down. Everything cleaned off. Dig into my sponge and chocolate custard, and it was sponge, and it was fucking gravy, mate. Because oh. I, <laughs> I hadn't seen gravy or chocolate custard for so long, I can I thought, oh, the the this brown liquid next to the sponge must be hot cho- uh, cust- chocolate custard. And I ruined my first uh, dessert, so I left for a dessert in Bastion those months before. Came back first dessert after, and it was fucking gravy. Ruined it, and there was no more because the, the, the hot plate had shut down. I was just got. I was got to tell you this. It don't relate to this in any way. I than the story you just told, but um, earlier this year, we were, we were, I was going off to this event, and we, we stopped by at this guy who's uh, he's done really well for himself, right? He's, he's <clears throat> gone from basically he, he grew up, in fact, not far from here actually, um, and he, he's done this massive deal, and he, he's he's sorted for the next couple of centuries probably. Anyway, we're at his house. I mean, his his dining room was kind of the size of my whole footprint of my house and the garden and everything. Massive it was. And had this lavish sort of Christmas dinner laid on for us, right? And we sat there and he, his wife was sat here, he sat opposite and then some other guests and that. Having all the, oh, a lovely scoff it was. And then come out with a coffee. I'm like, well, that coffee's nice. And there's a silver jug on the on the table. So I picked the jug up, I poured it in. I thought, well, that's a bit... Bit stodgy that coffee like, I put back there, <laughs> and I, I had two cups of it. <laughs> and uh, I said, what, "What was that coffee?" Then she went, "Oh, that wasn't coffee. That was custard." <laughs> oh my god! Putting custard in your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so I just invented a new drink. Word embarrassed in the slightest. <laughs> but just going back to what we were talking about, um, I, I a couple of years ago. You were saying about you're not allowed to talk about this extraction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A couple of years ago, or I, oh, I still know this guy uh, who was in the RAF, <coughs> and a couple of years ago he was talking to a friend of his, can't not about me particularly, but like, oh yeah, I know this guy who was in Afghan and about Muscala, and the bloke he was talking to said I was uh, one of the loadies on on the helicopters that picked him up. Oh, He's yeah. like, oh right. Uh, he said, but before we got there. We had to fly out and land somewhere in the desert and then shoving bales of dollars out the back of the helicopter into the desert for the Taliban, basically, to to yeah. secure this extraction. Which, at the time, I was like, okay, I'm surprised by that, and they paid all that money out. But now I'm constantly thinking, how much did they pay per person? What, did they, what, value, what the value did they put on each 
person's life. Considering we had Afghans with us as well, you know, did they did everyone get the same value or did they price us higher? It, I reckon I got just... more than you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're younger than me, so they'd probably they get a bit more time out of you, wouldn't they? But yeah, but yeah and, uh, and and going back to your previous point about most biggest impact, and I, I kind of chose the flight out and getting back. I kind of uh, everything in between is just I don't know. It, it, not that I don't think about it. I think my my memory of it's pretty bad of which period sorry so you said the most impactful oh, yeah. times and i said about flying out to masakala <laughs> and getting back from masakala <laughs> whereas all the things that went on in in masakala were quite impactful if you see what i mean but that's all kind of splodged into like my timeline of it and everything is is probably a bit messed up and you got the logbook though haven't you yeah yeah, yeah. but that's that's of specific, it's like a factual thing. It's just of an incident like a small arms contact or uh, more around or this. It, it, it doesn't, for example, there was a time when we had um, mortars into the compound. There was lots of us. Yeah, well, yeah, but it, that's what it says in the, in the, in the, in the logbook. But subsequent to that was going out and because the, Somebody had said, oh, there's a UXO, unexploded mortar round, near the Alamo it was. And because I've done mine clearing, or been trained in mine clearing and all that, we went out to have a look at this thing. And I crawled up on my belly with my knife, clearing it around it and all that. And there was these fins sticking out. And the next thing, you just hear that, with a mortar round going off. And it's like... And um, we'd had another contact, and the mortars were just behind me, and they'd open fire. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm just leaving that there now. I'm not going back <laughs> to it. But it, so yeah, you look in the logbook, but it's the actual consequences of of those contacts. You know, it's oh, they had a contact at ten twenty, small arms fire from the west. But what was the actual result of that? You know, did someone get wounded? Did uh, mm. um. Was it because the helicopter was trying to get in? You know, there's all these other elements to that. So, yeah, I can see what we did, but it's all the stories associated with that that aren't in, in there. It's just a clinical review of, of what went on. Yeah. How did you end up getting going from the Reg to do what you do now, Bruce? Uh when I come up to leaving the army, I was like, oh, God, these brilliant ideas, what I want to do, and this, that, and the other. And that all went tits up, so nothing, nothing came to fruition. And uh, in a bit of a panic, I um, I took an FTRS contract at the army prison, MCTC. And I was there for a, about 18 months. I didn't love it, but it was a six-hour shift, essentially. Okay. Well, yeah, that sounds great, but it's it's seven days a week. Uh, sorry, six days a week. Well, let's get this right. Yeah, you do six days, and then you'd have two days off. So you do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Friday Saturday, <coughs> then you have Sunday, Monday off, and then it rolls all the way over. On top of that, you think, oh, I've got a wedding next week, but I'm on duty, so I'll, I'll swap it with somebody. So then you've got to do two weeks. 14 days without a day off but in, in in amongst all that you need another day off for something else so you swap that again and then before you know it you've got like five or six weeks without a day off although you're only doing six hours a day so it'd be uh six hours six till midday midday till six but then you'd have a, a week of nights from six at night till six in the morning and it, it yeah on the face of it it sounds like oh, it's only six hours a day great but it, in reality it's, it's quite and you're locked in all day as well but moving on from that to your question um a friend of mine was like a friend of mine work works work he now he still does work for bruce and um 
he was looking for an apprentice at the time. And because it's a bit of a rural location, getting a young lad who can drive up there and then to college and this, that and the other was, was proving quite difficult. Um, my mate said, look, he, he's done engineering, he's this, that and the other, because I did an apprenticeship at Royal Small Arms Factory before joining join the army. Um, and he can, obviously he can drive and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's kind of how it come about. I had met him a couple of times before. Um, so it wasn't like a... Who, Bruce? Yeah. Okay. How come? Uh, for another friend of mine who had some stuff he was storing up there. He'd been up there a couple of times and showed me around a museum and all that sort of thing. So he did, didn't, he did know me to a small extent. And, uh, that was around, that must have been back end of 2012. So I've been there 10 years now. Enjoy it. In fact, explain, people, explain <laughs> to people what you do. Uh, well, so basically, when I started up there, right, back in 2012, um, it's a company that, well, in fact, it's not, it is a company, but Bruce has basically got one of the biggest private collections of military in the country, right, if you can count all the vehicles and all the rest of it. Been doing that for 30 or 30 plus years. Uh to fund some of that, he does restorations for clients. So they've got an old, let's say for example, an old World War Two Jeep, and someone wants it restored, and he'll restore that. So it's anything from like a World War Two Jeep right up to the most recent thing that we did up there was a Panther tank. Huh. Um, that's now gone to Australia. So there's all these things in between that, and that's where we started off doing that. Along the way... Um, one of the TV companies wanted to make a program about restorations. So they got into several different companies who do that sort of thing. Um, and they came and did like a pilot episode up where we are. And after they did their assessment of how the pilot went, they were like, actually, we're not going to do all these different companies. We just want to come to you and do it. And that started around 2013. And we were still doing it right up to and during COVID. It only takes about maybe three months of the year to film a series. Um, the other nine months of the year is all just, well, for me, a normal job. It's not a normal job for everyone else, but I go to work nine till five, Monday to Friday, basically. Um, and then when they <coughs> do the filming, it's not three months solid, but it'll be over a three month period. Um, and that's why all the TV shows and that have, have come out in regards to that. So yeah, it's uh, have they all the been under the combat what, dealers you know, banner? It's who you know. <laughs> have they all been under the combat dealers banner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there's forty five plus episodes now. Yeah. Do you find that being involved? Because you mentioned last time we spoke, you mentioned about um, uh, going and getting some mental health support. You mentioned the last thing yeah. I spoke. Do you do you think that being so sort of being in the military bubble, even after leaving, was a benefit? Is a benefit or is not? Because some people, they, yeah, it, they, it it's is not. It some is, people it is. It certainly is a benefit. Well, certainly in my case, I think it's. Some people might say it's not because. <clears throat> Things present themselves to you, and it's what you decide to do with that situation as to whether it becomes a positive or negative event. Good example. Um, so there are a lot of people you see quite regularly social media. They say, "Oh, I'm having this problem. I'm having that problem." Blah blah blah, and. All their mates rally round and they're like, oh, you know, you'll be fine, this, that and the other. But it's not professional help. But they don't want to ask for the professional help, although it's there. So that the that it's been offered to them, but if they don't accept it, then it's going to seem like it's a neat, they're like, oh, well, they didn't do anything for me. But they can't do anything for you unless you ask for it. They can't come round and grab you by the scruff in the neck and take you away and put you through a process you've got to you've got to be committed to doing it 
otherwise it, it, it won't work. That's how I see it. But there, there's so much help out there. And if you're, let's say, two individuals are suffering with, with a similar issue with mental health, right? But one of them has been in the forces and the other one hasn't. The one that hasn't might only have a network of friends of 10, 15 people. But the guy who's been in the forces might have a network of friends of 100, 150 people. And you, you make that right connection, he's got a better chance of, of getting through it a better chance, I'm not saying that he will get through it, he's got a better chance of getting through it if he's prepared to take the the help or the opportunities or whatever that are offered to him. Whereas the, the other person who's got a network of 10 or 15 friends, out of them 10 or 15, none of them might have a, any idea of what to do in the first place. So I do think having been in the military gives you better chance of getting through it provided mm. you're going to accept it or yeah. provided you can acknowledge there's an issue in the first place what was your what was what was your experience what were you experiencing that led you to go and get professional help uh, see this is a bit of a tough one because other than you, I don't think I've told anyone. But, well, well, you don't have to. I'm if you don't, have to, no, if you don't no, want to mention no, it, you don't have to. Um, so pretend it's only me, it's not HR no, podcast. No, I'm trying to think, rather than just, <laughs> oh, this happened. Uh, it's hard to explain sometimes, yeah, isn't it? So yeah, so now I look back, right, I think I've been going on, I don't, I think been going on a long, long, long time, right, Bef before Afghan, even. And, uh, Every, for me, things I was doing were just normal things. <laughs> and some of them, now I look back on it, I can see what's... So I'm driving down the road and somebody's parked their car on a stupid angle and I, I'm like shouting abuse. Yeah, fucking arse, I fucking park a car like that. And my missus is like, who are you talking to? <laughs> who are you shouting at? I'm like, well, look, the bloody parking like that, just being uh, inconsiderate to everyone else and all that sort of thing. Or it just these, sh I look back, it's so ridiculous, some of these things. But anyway, and I'd lose my temper with stuff. Pretty, like, well, I like to think there's not really anything going on anymore, but the other day the keyboard weren't working on my computer. <laughs> I tried about 25 batteries in it, and it's pl unplug it, plug it in again. Still wouldn't work. Then I just smashed it to pieces. <laughs> There's no need for it. I could have just put it in the bin, but it made me feel better for smashing it to pieces because it <laughs> wouldn't do what it's supposed to do. And and I used to have that all the time. That that was kind of a one-off. But behaving like that was just just everyday normal life for me, you know. And uh, the kids and my missus be like, oh, you, "What are you doing?" Uh, you know, they're always saying, "You need to get some help. You need to get." And I'm like. It's just normal. Everybody's like that. But <laughs> partly, some of the people I knew were like that, you know? So I didn't see anything wrong with it. But subsequently also found out that they were having issues and all the rest of it. Anyway, it, all this goes on and on and on. I'm thinking everything's hunky-dory. My close family are telling me otherwise. And uh, this happened at work because my son used to work with me. He doesn't not work with me anymore because of this incident. It was because of COVID and all the rest of it. But anyway, we, I'd, unfairly, I'd lose my temper over something and I would I would take it out on him, you know. Oh, fucking hell. You're not pulling your weight. Uh, and I, I would... It still makes me feel sick to my stomach. Some of the things I said to him and that was quite horrible. Um... And that, that's just what I said to him. Anyway, we, he, he got a bit older and braver and this particular day he, he stood up to me sort of thing. And I was like, Phew. and it it was like an out-of-body experience, right? I'm out, I'm here, looking at myself, shouting at myself. Just fucking, just calm down. Just relax. <laughs> it's no big deal. I can't even remember what, what the 
developed over. Anyway, he started getting a bit of pushing and shoving. And Is he bigger than you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, uh, <laughs> you know, from our background, that don't mean nothing, does it? You don't back down. <laughs> anyway, um, it, it, it got so heated, and like, so I'm having this like, almost out of body experience thing. And that's the, this is looking back on it, this is the point at where I thought, no, there is something not right. I I wanted to do him some real serious harm, right? And luckily, where this occurred, there was, because we're in these workshops, there's all kinds of stuff around everywhere. But luckily, where this occurred, there wasn't really anything there. And, it's, and I'm looking around for something. Oh, a weapon. Yeah. I'm, or a lamp. At that moment. No, at that moment, I I wanted to do as much harm to him as I possibly could. Right. Anyway, so I'm, and he's like, bah, bah, and he stomped off, and uh, he got one of the blokes to give him a lift, and he went down to the station, and he went home, and didn't speak to me for like, I don't know, be- best part of a month or whatever. Anyway, after that, I was like, oh, went back into work, and. Uh, I wouldn't even say it was then. It was probably a day later. I was just thinking, that is absolutely not right. You know, I, I, I love my son the, to the ends of the earth. Uh, but the thoughts I was having there and then were, were not right. Even if you're a bit angry with your kid or whatever, you know, you, you don't want to... Lose control. And I... I Oh, I can't tell you how that made me feel absolutely shit. It was like they've been telling me this for years and years, and I've been ignoring them. What I would say is, it. Well, anyway, let's carry on from there. But you know, he still says to me, he still haven't apologised to me, <laughs> and I haven't. Because I, I still don't want to admit that that's how I how I felt about him at the time. But like I say, it was like an out of body experience. What are you doing, you nutcase? Anyway, as a result of that, I was like, it, it can't go on. So I, I um, support our paras has got a, a point of contact. You can get in touch with him and say, look, I'm having trouble with this, that, or the other, or whatever. And then I had an initial meeting with him. I said, look. Personally, I don't think there's anything really wrong, but how I was with my son the other day was completely, totally wrong. I, I, I don't ever, ever want to experience that again. <laughs> Not from my own personal thing. You know, if it'd been a different situation, I may have ended up harming him, and I don't think we'd ever have been able to come back from that. And they're like, "Yeah, okay," and then. Um, they organised some stuff for me, went to see a psychiatrist, etc, etc. And I just kept saying, look, I really don't think there's anything wrong, but I see myself on this pathway that isn't going where I want it to go, and I'm hoping that maybe we can get it dealt with. And uh, I, I have no idea what they did. I had a few sessions, and... Like my wife and my kids and that are like you're absolutely a hundred percent different to where you were before. You know, you know things go wrong now, and I'm just like, nah, don't worry about it. You know, almost never, ever, ever get cross apart like with the keyboard the other day. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I mean that is a real stupid thing. But what I was going to say earlier about is in my I've only started talking about this because I went to something a couple of weeks ago and a guy stood up and was talking about his experience and it was very similar in how he felt and issued that over his child and all the rest of it. I'm saying child, didn't you talking like my son was 25, something like that. He's not like talking about little kids. And uh, I thought, actually, it's not just me. There's other people who've got that same sort of thing going on and in a way because of how that happened I feel a bit lucky because 
I was concerned about the harm I might do someone else. And I, I knew that I need to get that sorted out. But there are people that only want to harm themselves. And there isn't any concern because you're not hurting anyone else. There's a lot less concern. And and that happens a lot. And it's less obvious you know? that is an issue. Say again? And it's less obvious as an issue to the outside person. To yeah. People. Yeah. And, and so for me, it was because I really don't want that to happen. I need to go and see someone and get it sorted out. But if you're thinking about doing that to yourself, it's like, well, nobody will care. Or, uh, I don't know because I haven't been in that situation, but you haven't got a, a moment that's going to make you think, that's not right, I need to go and speak to someone. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. It does make sense. I mean, uh, that, you know, lose... <laughs> Losing your temper, I think, to your point, there are people who just think that's normal. As in losing your temper where you're flying off the handle and you can't control it. Yeah, but over stupid things. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah well, well, much. arguably, Freddie, you shouldn't lose your temper uncontrollably in any situation. You yeah, yeah, I mean? no. Because yeah. losing your temper uncontrollably and getting violent in a situation is different to getting violent in a situation because the situation is escalated. They're two different things. Um, but that uh, that lack of control and anything, it's it, you know, it's it's absolutely not normal. But um, but it's like you said, it's sometimes these things do seem normal, especially from a background like yourself, where you've probably you've probably met and been around multiple times more people than the normal Joe blogs will have been, yeah. because even just in the military, you just meet. And experience shit loads of people, shit loads of experiences. You see, at least see those things, you know. And so, what is perceived as the range of normal is uh, there are more extreme things in there than than, than Joe Bloggs. So that losing your fly off the handle, becoming violent is much more normal to do than the average Joe Bloggs person. But uh, but then, like, I was never apart from that incident with his son. I was never violent towards people I certainly thought about it a lot um, but I always seem to have that fingernail grip on it becoming mm. irreversible you know going that stepping over that line um, do you remember do you remember uh, had you been to a psychiatrist before this? No. Do, you, do you remember the first time you went into the psychiatrist yeah I think most people do what was that like what were your expectations well, it, it was nothing like I, had, I expected it to be. What did you expect it to be? Well, I thought it'd be like, you know, like a doctor's uh, surgery thing. You know, they sat the other side of the desk tapping them on the computer. <laughs> right, tell me this, tell me that. Uh, you know, went in, there's like this big comfortable chair and books and stuff on the walls. And it was quite a big office, actually, as far as I remember it. And it's like, all right, well. And it just started chatting away and... It, my memory of it is just for an hour a week, I'd have to go and have a go and sit and have a chat with somebody about all kinds of everything, and I we're never really particularly focused or not that I remember focused on it on anything, and uh, which is another <coughs> kind of thing is I said about the guy had stood up and told about his experience, and I thought actually I can really relate to that. His was based on a particular event, but I I can honestly say I don't think I think mine was like an accumulation of things rather than one specific event. Oh, okay. So you so an, accumul an accumulation of experiences that uh, that was causing the sort of loss of temper and thoughts to get worse. Yeah, because yeah. You, you know you. That's a misconception. A lot of people, yeah, yeah. So, so that is the misconception people have is a lot of people will, when they like sort of self assessing and they're trying to work out, trying to understand things, they'll they'll think it is down to a particular event or experience they had, one in particular. And sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. Other times, to your point, it's not. It's an accumul accumulation of things through accumulation of experiences and the accumulation of you reconciling or trying to understand those experiences and that leads you to where you are now in that sort of mental mental 
mathematics, mental mental mathematics, or yeah, crazy yeah. mental mathematics to bring you to where you are now. Because sometimes you get your brain gets the maths wrong and you end up flying off the handle more and more and more and it gets worse and worse and worse, as an example. Or your drinking gets heavier and heavier. Yeah. Or substance abuse or you, de- you go into depression or you know, all those other symptoms of what, whatever illness you're suffering with. Yeah. It's not I mean, uh, prior to that, with my son, I'd say maybe a couple of years before that, it was Christmas Day and we were going to my mum's, right? And I'd loaded all the car up and I went, right, come on, let's go. And they're like, oh, I haven't got this, I haven't got that. And I'm just like, right, oh, fuck it, we're not going anywhere, that's it, fuck it. But we ain't got anything in for Christmas Day, like dinner and all the rest of it, because we're going to my mum's. And uh, I stomped off down my shed, I'm like, oh, fuck it, I'm pottering around in there. And I knocked this bloody box of split pins over, right? There's about a thousand in this box. And they're all over the floor. And that, I was just like, no, oh, fuck it. Right. No, they're like, come on, trying to calm me down. No, that's it. I've got to sort these out now. So Christmas Day, I'm knelt on the floor in my garage, sizing all these split pins up and putting them back in the, in the box, in the thing. They're all sat in the house. We've got no Christmas dinner or nothing going on in there. And uh, I'm kind of like, well, I can't go back up there now because I'm going to think I'm complete and utter cunt. <laughs> and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to just put all these split pins back in the box. You know, and at that point, I should have realised that's not really normal thing to be doing. But whilst I thought it was odd, I didn't think it was... It was like, yeah, well, I've still got to pick all these split pins up at some point. I might as well do it now. Um, but, yeah, I, I would say, you know, going right back to... Yeah, about 92. A, a culmination of events that maybe I wasn't necessarily involved in, but close to, over that period of time. Um, we go back to Kosovo. I mean, nobody really talks about Kosovo in the slightest little bit, but and people say, oh, it was this with the dead bodies. and The, the, the number of dead bodies there, and they were like proper decomposing and stuff, and... And there were executions as well. They weren't like someone killed in a firefight and all that. They were just civilians, husbands, wives, and in some cases children. You know, but I was late, mid, late 20s then. You know, you're just you're immortal when you're that age. Um, so there's that. And then you go on, you've got Iraq, and there's more death and destruction, and then Afghan. And the, but also over those periods of time, you're getting closer to the cause of that death and destruction. So in Kosovo, it was kind of peacekeeping. Iraq was a war kind of footing, but we never really got into it. And in Afghan, you're actually there on the front line doing that kind of thing. Closely, oh, so you, you mean the risk to your life and you get yeah, closer yeah. to... Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, got it. You get closer and to And then it. on top of that, <laughs> there's the things like, well, I broke my back, I broke my pelvis, I broke my femur, my arms... There's all those, that's why I think it's just an accumulation of all that stuff. And then I've just carrying on with things, right? Getting on with life. So when something doesn't, simple, doesn't do what it should do, it's like, I suppose, now looking back on it, I can kind of think, I've gone through all of this, and you can't even just connect to the computer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is your sole job. <laughs> so you right, to the keyboard? <laughs> well, yeah, there's kind of stuff in... You know, and uh, anyway, it ended up, my m- m- missus just picked it up, and she's like dangling it there, showing my son, the he's like, oh, he's off on it again, isn't he? But no, that is seriously probably the only instant since uh, they'll support our parents sorted me out, basically. Yeah, but a good thing, but the thing is, now you're aware of it. I think that's the important well, thing. Well, it, like, uh, it is, yeah. because I like to think there's at least three people I've seriously helped out in encouraging them to get in touch by telling them my story because they're probably looking at me thinking, oh, he's all right. You know, he's doing that stuff on the telly. He's happily married. He's this, that, and the other. He's got nothing to worry about. And I didn't particularly have anything to worry about because I didn't think there was anything going on. But then I'd say, look, that's not, that's not what it actually is. Just... What you got to lose? Just give him a ring. Say, look, 
I think I might be having some problems. Can you come and tell me if I am or not? Don't if they say you are, don't be ashamed of it. You know, yeah, all right. I'm sitting here talking to you about it, but it's not something I really. Well, it isn't something I've spoken to or about before, other than to people that I'm trying to encourage to go and get a bit of help. And I would genuinely say that if, as a result of that and the recognition of things with the education, that there are at least three or four people I've, I've been able to get help for, again, through support our powers. Mm, that's good, mate. I, yeah, the power of... <coughs> Using your experiences to help others, or sharing experiences in, in a not in a not a uh, everyone's a victim way, or and I'm the fucking messiah and I can help you because it's not it's not the way it is, right? Uh, we 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 need. I think one of the things that's, that's improving but still got a long way to go is the way we perceive our mental health and the way compared to the way we perceive our physical health. Your elbow hurts today. You know, and say you got a restricted range of motion because maybe it's swollen. And you think about yes, you think how has that happened? Well, first off, you notice it and you're conscious of it, and you go, how has that happened? You think back, I was yesterday when I whacked it on that panther, mm. you know, that we were um, refurbing or um, what you call it? Yeah, refurbing, restoring, restoring. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, restoring. Um, and then in your mind, then you try and do actively try and do less with that arm to give it a chance to recover. And then two days time, three days time, if it's still not recovered or not improving, or maybe it's getting worse, then you go and get help for it. And we should, we really should do the same with mental health, but we don't only because we're just not, we're just not sensitive to it enough. So like I've got a friend who I'm trying to remember the exact symptom. I think it's, and he said this to me a few months ago and uh, he's, struggling to he, over the last six months nine months he can't he's really struggling to read more than the paragraph in a book focus before not an issue but he's i say in a book a power, a, anything, yeah. right he's really struggling to read to maintain a focus and for whatever re, i say for whatever reason in whatever way whatever it is he, he can't do it and he, he mentioned he mentioned this to me flip not yeah flippantly to stop just talking and i say have you gone to have you gone to something about that no well you should go to something about that. And if, when you think of it like that, if you and I think about this 10 years ago, you wouldn't go to the doctor. Like, you wouldn't think, mm. I'm going to go to that seat, because you probably wouldn't even notice it. And then you wouldn't even go to the doctor. But why the fuck wouldn't you? So I said to, said to him, he hadn't been. I said, why the, why the fuck wouldn't you go? That's like, that's an issue. And it's a, it seems to be a small issue now. But not only because it's not part of your day job that you have to close reading, right? Or whatever. But that could be in six months' time or two years' time, five years' time worse than what it is now with that focus yeah, impact but that, other things. that's the point yeah, he told you that and that's the stage he's at but it could go back four or five years and he started off he'd read old book in a night sort of thing and it's like oh, just a couple of chapters then a chapter then a page and now he's at the stage you can just read a paragraph but it's that slow thing over time you know you don't look like you've changed to me in the slightest bit, right? But if we took a, put a picture of you from 2006, you've changed quite a lot since 2006. But oh, that gradual change over that period of time isn't really noticeable. But when you put the two together, it's quite significant. And that also, again, I'm, I'm no way qualified whatsoever to talk about it medically, but potentially that's how it avoids detection because it's small changes over a period of time till it's unrecognisable and again it, it appears normal so why would you need help because that's just how I've always been you think that's how you've always been and it isn't no I because we, that's the thing with you fall over and break your arm it's quite obvious it's broken and you need help but whatever it's caused to upset something in your head could have been years ago, and it's just slowly generated the situation or the the condition you're in now. Well, it's all it's it's almost the same mechanism as as, as injuries you get from overcompensating. You got yeah. an injury in your left leg, and you oh, and you unconsciously overcompensate by leaning your left leg more 
for months and yeah. months and months while, say, a broken leg's recovering. You ain't even noticing what's going on with the left leg until you fully recovered. And then, in a year's time, your left leg's got an issue. Yeah. Like, I don't know, stress fracture or something. You know, it's, it's in the same way. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> the same way. But the thing is, with the, in the same way with the physical health, if you if it goes unchecked, unnoticed, and you don't do anything about it, the longer you leave it to go on, to, the longer the recovery is. The longer the same with the same with the, men, the, same with the yeah. mental health. The longer you leave that lack of focus on a paragraph in a book, or uh, like uh, losing your temper and the thoughts, and the longer you leave that before addressing it, the longer it takes to recover from it because it just it's just gotten worse and it has a, the impact on it. It's deeper embedded. Same with the mental health. Like I don't think it's sound too odd. Just go and fucking get a fucking scene. But it's unlike it. me, you fall over and you break one of two. Or both of the bones in your arm. There's hundreds of different ways it can uh, affect yeah. you. Yeah. And it is a lot about education, you know. Like I say, from my experience, I now have a better idea when somebody might be struggling. And there, there are other people that are clearly struggling. You know, you can go on social media and people are saying, "Anyone help me out with this? I'm having a real down time." Blah blah blah. And you can tell them, look, you need to speak to someone or speak to these people. And they're like, no, 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 I don't. I just, I need my mates and that. Your mates only can only do so much. You personally have to make that choice because nobody's going to come and grab you and drag you somewhere against your will. You have to just say, look, all right, I don't think there's anything wrong, but can you have a look at me? You know, like you were saying about that ache or pain. I think I've just sprained it, but can you just give us an x-ray just in case I've torn a ligament or something, you know, because you're not a professional. You might not have torn a ligament. They might just go, no, you're just whinging, which that's great. If you're just whinging, then fine. But if there's something genuinely wrong, you need to get it sorted yeah. out. Go and go to the expert advice, absolutely right. And it's fucking free, man. It's free. It's free. You don't yeah. have to pay for it. And you can get, and, and especially in the, like the military community, there's all the, the charities and not even the charities you get, you get the regimental support and that can put you in the right direction you can get seen really none of this waiting weeks and weeks or months and months for the nhs you can get seen really quickly go in go and speak to someone That's it. locally just, as well we haven't got to travel all over they've got people all over the country yeah. or a connection to people all over the country yeah yeah i think with the mental health thing is especially the next military side people have a what, that's why i asked you about what you what do you remember about the psychiatrist people I don't know what they think in their head about what that first conversation looks like. Where they think they have to spill the beans and they're sitting there with a box of Kleenex and they're crying. They're expected to say, "Oh, I I did this thing. Oh, I saw that thing." It doesn't work like that. Like it's the same way as you go to a doctor for a physical injury. You go into the doctor, you book it. You know, you get in front of the doctor and the doctor goes, "Right, what's the problem?" And you may go, "I'm not sure," but this, this, symptom, symptom. this symptom, this symptom, this symptom. What's, uh, you're going to see a psychiatrist, or a counsellor. It may not even be a counsellor or a psychiatrist, maybe something else. Or maybe a GP you're going to see. What's the problem? Not sure, but a fly off the handle. I've been doing it for a while and it's getting worse. Or I'm not sure, but I struggle to get out of bed in the morning. I Nothing motivates me. Or I'm really fucking unhappy all the time. I don't know what the problem is, but these are the symptoms. What Can you help me? And the doctor goes, okay. This is what I recommend. Or I need to ask you some more questions. We need to do some further analysis. It's the same on the physical as the mental health. Don't worry about it. It's like no one's going to try and wrap you up in cotton wool and not be perceived as weak or a fucking victim. But you owe it to yourself to go and get something checked. If you're mentally not operating, if you're not where you want to be, and you just go and find out. What I would say is, um, you asked <coughs> earlier about, do you think there's a benefit to being in the army or not? Oh, in a military environment. Yeah. <coughs> so... If you, if you, and I'll, <laughs> if you are do think you're having problems, I would strongly recommend you ask. You go and contact somebody. If you did it through a military organisation, for example, I want to keep saying it, Sport Air Paris or some of the others, that is different to just going to your GP, who he may think. Oh, Got another another person here who just wants to try and get a couple of quid off the government sort of thing. Because of your background, people are already going to think, oh, I could understand that there really could be a problem here. There might not be. But because of his background, we should check it out. Do you, do you see what I mean? It's like 
if you were if you went into the doctors and said, "Oh, I think I've got radiation poisoning," they go, well, <laughs> <laughs> "Where'd you work?" Oh, on a on a, I work on a farm. He's straight away he's going to think, chances of you having radiation poisoning are zero. But if you went, "Oh no, I work at Sizewell Power Station," he's already going to think, "Well, maybe we should check this out." Do you see what I mean? So, if you've been in the forces and you get in touch with someone saying, I think I might be having some problems, they're, sh they're not going to think, oh, there we go. They're, they're straight away going to think, well, there is a chance, good, because so many people do have it, you know. It, it's not it's not a it's not a small percentage of people, you know. All right, it's to different degrees, certainly. Um, but when it gets to those extremes, it's it's really, really, really hard to convince someone to to get the help that they might need. Mm. Yeah, like, like to your point, the, the onus is on the individual. Ninety-nine yeah. point nine percent of the time, you know, really quick. Um, you need to do it yourself. You need to be willing. Oh, you you said there, you didn't. You know, you went and you weren't. You you didn't think there's anything wrong with you, but you still went. Uh, and that was difficult. yeah. I didn't. I didn't think so. Again, at the time, I'm like. Look, I read or see all these people have got these serious problems. I'm no, I'm nothing like that. But I had this issue, and I don't want to end up in that position. But there's nothing to say that I was not in the same position as them. I'm just dealing with it differently. You know, it, it, yeah. It's just not worth letting that little thing fester and becoming a. A real, real serious life threatening situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right, we're done. What have you not mentioned that you wanted to mention? Um, coffee's not too bad. <laughs> That's from Aldi, actually. You like that? Yeah, Aldi, see, Aldi. you're on about brands <laughs> earlier on. <laughs> I shop at Aldi. Aldi oh, Little okay. all day long, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Every, I get everything from there apart from power tools. That's a no no. Oh, and um, oven gloves. Don't get those. Do not. <laughs> well, do not get oven gloves. I know it's a bit sexist, but I'm married, so I don't have to worry about <laughs> that sort of thing. And you referred to the GP as he. Did I? I don't know why I did that because I've not been able to get a GP appointment for over a year. <laughs> well, again, and just quickly flipping back to that, you mentioned it earlier. You know, you, you can go to a, a, a military organisation, they'll get you sorted out quite quickly. I honestly, just again, a mining, minor niggling thing, trying to get a doctor's appointment for over a year. Because you've got a phone at 8 o'clock, at 8 o'clock I'm an hour and 10 minutes up the road. So if I get through and they go, oh yeah, we've got an appointment at 9, I'm never oh going to get back God. for it. Yeah. Or... I get to work and I'm like, I'm going to have to have the day off because I've got to go back from the appointment at two, three, four o'clock or whatever. Or I take the day off to make the appointment. I get for an hour, we've got none left for today. So it kind of gets to the point where I just don't bother anymore. It's like, well, I'll either get better or I'll die. So it can't be that. You know? <laughs> that's, that's the options you got nowadays. <laughs> but again, that sort of thing, I'd have phoned up and not got through or not got an appointment and I'd have completely lost my rag. Now I'm just like, just, yeah, just why it is. Yeah, yeah. Right, bit of pleasure. Uh, probably, uh, after seeing some of the people that you've had on there, I'm thinking this is going to be the most boring one. <laughs> no, <ever done>. no, <laughs> no. no, I enjoyed it. It's good chat, mate. Good chat. I enjoyed it. I really did enjoy it. And I uh, should do it again, and we should sort Bruce out. <laughs> um, well, hang on. Right, so where can people, where can people see you on TV, Freddie? Oh, mate, it is on repeat constantly on Discovery Channel. Combat Dealers. Combat Dealers, yeah. It's all over YouTube. You don't well. sound too happy about that. So, a lot of people want <laughs> money and fame, right? Yeah. I wouldn't mind having a few quid because we don't really <laughs> get paid anything for doing this uh, show, and I wouldn't. Oh, I certainly ain't got it, the fame, right? But you go to certain events, military events predominantly, and people will recognise you from it. And it's great, you know, you think, oh, brilliant. But but it's also not great, because I used to love going to some of these shows. You just wander around all day, looking at stuff, talking to people, this, that, and the other. 
But sometimes now you kind of like, well, I'm going to avoid going over there because it's just going to get people wanting pictures and this, that, and the other. And and you never want to be rude to people, but sometimes you know people want like half an hour, forty five minutes of your time when you've only got a couple of hours somewhere. You're like, yeah. Hey, okay. 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 So yeah, there's the uh, and certainly like for Bruce, for example, he used to love going to these military markets all over Europe and that. Just one, spend the day wandering around. He can't do it now because as soon as he stops to look at something, oh no, no and and it. So yeah, he, he's got that bit of notoriety, but it, it's affected a lot of other things that he used to enjoy. So yeah, I just have the money over over the phone. <laughs> hint, hint. Yeah. People got fun in it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's uh, it's on repeat constantly, all the time on Discovery. I think. Yeah. Great, excellent, mate. It's been a pleasure. Let's uh, do it again. Let's get another coffee. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a Hey Chower patron? Hey Chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched. There are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the Hey Chower patrons. So before this podcast was recorded, I recorded an exclusive Q&A, a shorter interview structured around eight questions. All the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand, and that interview is online now for patrons. That happens every time. Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. And you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the H-Hour Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron. Easy peasy. If you prefer to listen to your podcast normally, H-Hour is also on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's on all of the podcast apps. And if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app, you can go to the, the H-Hour website, charliechannel1.com, and you can actually play the podcast, video or audio, directly through the website, through your browser. Simples. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a supporter. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.